Our next presenter is a dear friend and longtime member and past president of MSMTA. Molly Morrison, NCTM, is an active pianist and master teacher with degrees from Arizona State University and the University of Montana. Currently, she maintains a thriving independent studio in Missoula, as well as a diverse performance career, collaborating with a variety of instrumental, vocal, and chamber groups throughout the years. As an adjudicator, Molly's infectious energy and expertise are so kindly delivered that student performers lucky enough to encounter her are not only left with a trove of musical wisdom, but an improved impression of themselves as musicians. I asked each of our speakers to share a short quote or bit of wisdom from a former teacher that they continue to live by today. Molly told me that many quotes from cellist Pablo Casals have resonated with her throughout the years, particularly the following. Music remained for me an affirmation of the beauty man was capable of producing. And don't we need to hear that right now? <laughs> Molly adds, more recently, I was taken by a statement made in an interview with jazz saxophonist Kamasi Washington. He said, the beauty of music is in the search. It's never ending. Please welcome our dear friend and colleague, Molly Morrison. Well, first I would like to thank Jessica also. She's been doing such a lovely job with these introductions, but she has led our Montana State Music Teachers organization so capably for the last two years and helped us uh, keep up with the times. So thanks for bringing us into the 21st century, Jessica. <laughs> when she asked me to present at the conference, um, at first I hesitated because all of you have heard me do wor workshops and adjudicate in your communities throughout Montana already. But she said she was particularly looking for a topic relevant to the college member, student members and our new young teachers in the organization. And I thought, there is such a great need for a new generation of teachers and of independent music teachers. And that's, that's you. I think this is our college table here, right? <laughs> and so um, most of the other teachers have heard lots from me before, but I uh, came up with this topic with you in mind. Um, and so I'd like to share how I've stayed enthused in my piano studio throughout the years. Uh, I'm a single, self-supported musician and teacher and have been for the last 37 years. Uh, I guess I'm living proof that this is a viable and rewarding profession. <laughs> and uh, my experiences with uh, Missoula Music Teachers, the Montana State Music Teachers Organization, and the Music Teachers National Association, my performing and accompanying at the piano, the organ, the harpsichord, uh, workshop presenting, adjudicating, and teaching have made for a a varied and rich life. Uh, I hope that what I share today is sort of a, a, a trip down memory lane for me of the last 37 years. And I would like, I'm going to share some of my creative projects and activities um, and hope to inspire you to continue studies and your goal to dedicating your lives to music and teaching. So, um, as, I, as I say, most of the audience today, um, I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but <laughs> I hope you will enjoy. I wanted to start the first chapter, the first half of my presentation. I would like to cover some of these subjects relatively quickly, but they're very important elements of staying enthused with teaching and being viable. Um, it's very important for us to join and maintain your national membership, uh, uh, contribute to your state and local organizations, and attend your state and national conferences. I'm so glad to see you here. And as you can tell from our inspiring first session, that's what happens when you come to conferences. You learn so much and you get, you're in, revived for another, another year of being a musician and a teacher. Um, 
it's important to support your local music dealers. We in Montana are very fortunate to have, still have, music dealers that are thriving, have thriving businesses. And I have found that keeping my pedagogy uh, library up to date, what I call refreshing it uh, regularly, is a great way to stay excited about teaching. Um, subscribing to professional periodicals and reading articles. And again, always continuing to um, study and play your instrument uh, to hone your own skills. Our yearly state conference always features regional and nationally acclaimed artists and teachers, like Dr. Takas, whose session on Beethoven's mind just transported us to a higher level of musical understanding. So enjoy looking at this list, uh, starting from the first year that, not the first year that Montana State Music Teachers Organization existed, but the first year I had the pleasure of attending a conference. Um, and you can see they are the top names and authors in piano pedagogy. And they have inspired and informed us in Montana as members of the Montana State Music Teachers Organization. Um, I still remember Dr. Max Camp, which is amazing because I don't usually remember someone's name or maybe even a movie I saw two days ago. <laughs> but I, I really recall the first session I went to when I attended my first state conference. I was a piano pedagogy student at the University of Montana, and Dennis Alexander was my teacher. And um, I've only missed three state conferences since returning from graduate school in 1987. It's just a great way to stay enthused about our profession. Um, anyway, Max Camp was the featured presenter, and um, I still remember using this quote from him pretty much on a daily basis in my studio. Music is built and travels on its metric structure. So all my students know a lot about counting measures, <laughs> metrics counting. And, um, I, I still find his book, The Synthesis of Mind, Ear, and Body, a very interesting publication about the whole process of uh, learning to read music and play piano. They call it play piano. <laughs> in 1990, just to feature another one of those famous uh, presenters, Marianne Usler, who wrote The Well-Tempered Keyboard Teacher, which is still um, often used as a pedagogy text in college classes, was our main presenter. And I remember her very involved session on learning theories and stages of cognition. It was so fun to mentally explore uh, the meaning of learning with her. And um, are you using that text now by any chance, or have you seen it? The well-tempered keyboard teacher. It's also a great, a great text with all sorts of uh, information to help you know about the stages of learning and, um, and the methods and materials for teaching. Um, more recently, in uh, 2010, Jane McGraw was here. And she shared with us uh, her deep understanding of sequencing and um, and selecting intermediate repertoire. Uh, she, her series of books, Classics Alive, books one through three are a wonderful addition to our, to our libraries. And maybe my last plug for organizational <laughs> involvement uh, is that uh, I'm not sure if I have the dates right. I know March 22nd is correct, but when I looked at that 10, March 10th, I'm not. 17th, I thought, yeah, that's longer than they are. So March 17th through the 22nd, yeah, that was a little typo. <laughs> but we won't have a national conference come any closer to us than Spokane. And I think the last time it was here and I did attend was 1993. So hopefully uh, everyone will make an effort. Um, over the years, I've learned so much and enjoyed the camaraderie of 
teachers from across the United States. And part of this has been the through the contributions I've made as a local and state president, as a IMTF leader, a state librarian, and as the Northwest Certification Chair on the MTNA committee, which rewrote the national requirements for national certification that we have now. That was, there was a big learning curve on that, that volunteer job. <laughs> but very, very interesting. And um, so I, I encourage you to you know, maintain your membership after you graduate and, and, uh, and go, to, go to the conferences. But we really need the new generation coming up. Um, and we are the ones that are training students uh, who then go to college and who then become professional musicians. And it all starts at uh, the independent music teachers' studios. And uh, without that, I can't imagine uh, music continuing as it does. Um, so the professional periodicals I've read over the years, the American Music Teacher, of course, comes with our membership. The Clavier Companion uh, is uh, no longer uh, in, in existence, but the Clavier, the Keyboard Companion, and Piano Explorer is a publication tied to the Clavier magazine, written at about fifth grade level for students. It's a very nice resource that you can buy for your whole class uh, very cheaply uh, on a yearly basis. And The Pianist is a British publication written for amateur pianists who are enthusiastic and love piano. And I thoroughly enjoy reading it because it has current interviews with performing artists, performing pianists, uh, reviews of latest uh, CDs, latest recordings that are been produced. And, um, and then it has master class information and little mini lessons in different, different topics. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fun. And through, you know, through these publications and through my continuing to build my library, um, it spurred my creativity. And uh, it's fun to explore new repertoire and think of a particular student to motivate uh, through a certain piece. And you just, just an easy way to become more aware of that. Again, our local dealers, um, I mean, national conferences are an easy place to learn of new collections, as most of the big publishers and their featured composers attend and provide displays. What I've found when I go to national conferences, the fee to get there and to pay the registration fee is nothing compared to what I pay to buy the music that I bring home. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a joy to have all that, to have that library to refer to and, and to um, consider you know, what you want to try next for your student. Through the, through the local music dealer, uh, we are able to just go again and browse through publications. We're able to special order. Uh, there you get so much help and advice from them and also keep up with technology. So it was through Morgan Roth Music here in Missoula that I purchased my disc clavier um, and sound module soon after the technology was developed uh, by Yamaha. Since then, I've used it for duet practice. But what I've enjoyed the most is using it to keep a running record of my students playing over the years. And it's so fun after they get to be seventh or eighth graders and maybe are getting discouraged or think they're too busy to have them listen back to their tapes when they were third graders and fifth graders and sixth graders and see how far they've come and feel proud uh, because we always lose track in the midst of, of practicing. Um, it's also a great tool to have students use to prepare for a performance. And um, they can record themselves and listen back. It totally replicates 
exactly all the expressive sounds, the pedaling that they did, and they can sit free to listen. So it's a good way for them to learn to develop and evaluate their own, their own playing. With the addition of the sound module, which is sort of difficult to see, but it's on the top right. Um, so this is an acoustic piano, but the sound module is a digital synthesizer, and those sounds come through the speakers on either side. Um, many composers use this. You can record up to 12 tracks of, and say, I want that track. Play a part and say clarinet. Play another part, say strings. There's a tracks for percussion, everything. So sometimes in May, I have my students pick out some popular piece that they like and then go about recording, deciding how they might like to orchestrate it. What they find is that you have to be able to play with the metronome <laughs> because each track has to be in time. So uh, there are all sorts of great things to be learned from it. <laughs> Well, from there, I would like to go now into an area which is more about uh, the kinds of creative projects I've done in my studio, and um, which will include pictures and stories, handouts, and uh, some audio uh, clips from student recitals. Thanks to the Missoula Community Access Television, people, we are able to see some of these clips. And it's, they're like home videos. My mother took most of the video over the years. And the, I think my first example will be from 1996. And she didn't have any um, tripods then. So it's handheld. So there, it's a little, it, it will feel just like a little home movie. <laughs> but it's such a treat for me to look back and enjoy and get to see those. Um, so. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to uh, take them off of the DVDs that I owned and had transferred the original videos to if MCAT and Neil's one of the great guys there that helped me out. They were so generous and um, that I, I didn't have to do it by myself. In fact, I, I didn't do much. <laughs> anyway, um, let's start with uh, some of the theme recitals that I came up with. And some of these ideas were really to organize myself <laughs> and to keep myself enthused, you know. And uh, so as you can see, different composers, Gershwin, Bartok, Grieg, a waltz recital, a sonatina recital, a ragtime recital, and, and a pop music recital. There are a million possibilities, of course. I particularly enjoyed um, preparing special group lessons about every six weeks, which supplement my students' individual lessons, and with additional theory work and music history and um, performance practice and rhythm exercises. So through these, these classes, I've been able to focus my teaching and, and prepare what I call theme recitals. Um, I don't have any, any recordings from these recitals. But I thought you'd enjoy seeing some of the class materials I produced to prepare the students um, for these, um, these themes and uh, some of the listing of repertoire that, that they performed. Currently, my young students are working on selections from West Side Story. And as it is the 100th year of Bernstein's birth, well, they've never heard West Side Story. And of course, as you all well know, the rhythms, they are not easy to play. But talk about great music. Um, our goal is, towards the end of January, to play the selection of Bernstein's West Side Story at the um, senior residence. So, so I'm, I'm still coming up with theme recitals. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, the uh, Piano Explorer magazine I mentioned, this is the front cover of, of one of them, and it was featuring each, each, each month it features a particular composer and particular music. And, um, and, and so it would be something that I would include in my history articles and stories and in our group classes. This, these are all written about fifth grade level. So even your younger students can, can read those and enjoy those magazines. 
And this would be a fact sheet um, for George Gershwin um, that I would put together for my students with just a few little basic facts and maybe fun facts. Like I remember, I loved, loved at age 15, Gershwin was worked as a song plugger. And of course, we don't know what that is. Most don't know what that is. But since there wasn't television and there weren't recordings um, that for the general public and whatnot, people would be at a department store and there would be someone at the piano playing the latest cheap music and they were called the, a song plugger. So that was sort of selling, selling um, the, the, the music of the time before uh, we had all the amazing ways that we can easily <laughs> access music, right? Anyway, in 1998, I came up with what I called a concert series for a group of uh, eager junior high students. And uh, they performed throughout the year a series of concerts, we called it. And um, this included the Gershwin recital, a ragtime recital, a sonatina recital, and a waltz recital. Waltz recital. Um, now I sort of think about that and wonder if, if I'd get my kids to put on four recitals <laughs> like that. But it was, they were enthused. They were, they, and they were very proud and eager to share their, share their music. Um, so this was the program from the Gershwin recital. And as a result of the, his, the work in history, I would have students um, have a little they, were, they would read the lyrics to the song they were going to play and then give a little history. Three or four of them gave a little history about Gershwin and the time of music um, to the audience. And I recall actually playing the opening and closing tunes, Someone to Watch Over Me and Our Love is Here to Stay. Um, it's always good to play for your students, and it inspires them too. So in that program, I, I did. Well, moving on to Bartok, I did, we did a Bartok recital. We just played pieces from the Romanian folk dances and the sonatina, you know, things that were manageable for the level students. But so much to be learned from it. Um, I, it really taught the students how to um, read all the expressive markings. You can see at the bottom here on the sheet some of the different markings that Bartok uses in his, in his music. There's so many different amounts of uh, levels of accent and, and length of note and uh, the way that in his, in his uh, score, how, you could, how he could tell us what he imagined. The sounds he imagined, there's a lot on the score to see. Um, Bartok is also a great um, composer to use to, to feature uh, playing with mixed meters and um, compound meters, 5, 8, 7, 8, 9, 8, uh, which at first look a little daunting to students, but are so fun and really are only, as we know in music, we only have duple or triple groupings of rhythm. So, of course, me being a lover of rhythms, we did a lot of tapping. And this sheet, the, the L and the R at the top, is left and right. So, so but a group of five, a group of seven, eight, say we take the seven, eight, it can be a group of two groups of two and one group of three. Or it can be one group of three and two groups of two. Or it can be one group of two and one group of three and one group of two. So you can come up with seven a lot of different ways. And so um, this is a nice sheet because that one, every time you see that one, that's your strong pulse. Um, but it, it was pretty fun to do. Um, and something that, you know, they might not read a, song, a piece like that for a long time. But um, just when they listened to the Bartok, they could hear some of that. Uh, this was a fact sheet from the Sonatina recital. And uh, the Sonatina recital involved a field trip to the university. 
and with my group class, and we learned in, about the forte piano and also uh, got to play it. And so they were all playing music by the classical composers, and we had studied articulation and the techniques involved um, and the delicate, lively sounds. And um, it was, it really, you can talk for a long time and a person doesn't understand till they really feel the touch on the forte piano and they hear the sound. So just like what we were treated to with the Beethoven today, you could hear a very long lecture about those Beethoven sonatas, but when you have the combination of someone with a beautiful touch at the piano, um, exploring those sounds, you really get it. Plus, you want to be able to do it, right? We're all gonna go home and practice a little Beethoven. <laughs> anyway, so the Sonatina recital, and I just wanted to encourage um, student teachers, because you'll start out with young students um, for quite a while, and, and you'll always have young students, and they can start those articulations and that balance between the hand early on without being very good readers, because um, Dennis Alexander and Lynn Freeman Olson have, have sonatinas published. So um, is, we know the Kulau and the Diabelli and uh, you know all the all the main standards. We we know all of those. Uh, Clementi, I guess, wasn't on that list, <laughs> but but there are also ones for younger ones. Well, moving into another project, I in the course of you know summing through a really old pile of books, I found this book, The Jungle Cruise, a suite for piano and narrative by Anne Shannon Demarest. And as you can see, it was 295, so it's really published quite a while ago. But and I saw that the title on that book, and I thought, narrative. I have got the kid in my studio that would be a perfect narrator. <laughs> and so there he is, Will. And, and Will um, had been an entertainer already at school. He, I guess at, at the school's um, so, assemblies, he got to tell joke a joke at to begin the school assembly. So he's pretty used to an audience and liked an audience. Um, but he really didn't feel like anybody could teach him much of anything. So, <laughs> he might still be like that, but he's quite a player now, really. Anyway, Will, you can tell. Uh, he was pretty excited after that, because in the back of that picture, you know, he thanked me. And um, that was unusual. Thank you from Will, and uh, he was he was tickled. So, seven performers. I divided the the pieces up, and they have imaginative titles: uh, the snake dance, drum beats, the restless natives, the stalking leopard. Things that really spur their imagination to find sounds on the piano, and they would pray it up to the piano play their selection with Will interspersing the narration of the story. So imaginations were fueled and they were very dynamic performances. <laughs> of course, holidays are, are great, um, lend themselves to lots of creative projects. And uh, I've, at Halloween time, I'm sure most, most of the teachers here use that as a a chance to have a student explore writing their own compositions. And even your young students don't have to write, they can just explore the sounds and make up, make up things. So the top group was one of my young groups and uh, they had all shared their little Halloween sounds that they had in pieces they had on the piano and then we had a party. Um, older ones, I've found a downloadable um, and there's probably many of them. You know more about downloadable than I do. <laughs> but a downloadable program, a uh, composition program that's free called Muse Score. M-U-S-E-S-C-O-R-E. -S Muse Score. And it's quite easy to use. Uh, and it is, is free to download. And so these two girls uh, created their Halloween pieces and um, we celebrated performing for each other, and then enjoying pumpkin bars. <laughs> of course, Christmas lends itself to a variety of activities, and um, 
over the years, I've had caroling parties where uh, we all meet at a host family and students each would lead two carols. And uh, you know, it's not as easy to play when people are singing behind you. So that was sort of good practice. But we would warm up singing and then go out in the neighborhood and, um, and, and sing. But they had prepared their, their pieces at the piano. And I also used the disco ear and had students record I, one time, I, it was 70. I had 70 recordings of my students playing different Christmas music and on the disc. And uh, I had an open house, and the families and kids came with food. And in the background, the disc player was playing. And that was all of them. <laughs> so that was fun, too. But probably the favorite projects and crowd pleasers are the nutcracker recitals. So. How many of you have tried a nutcracker recital at the piano? Yeah. You know, there are lots of arrangements, great arrangements for a piano of the nutcracker music in, at different levels. So um, even at a uh, late elementary level. Um, but of course, it's not the orchestra. But still, it's a way to introduce them to that music. And, and some know it, some don't. Anyway, I, I had an old, a very old book that was a sweet book that had a little stories at the beginning above the, the, uh, each selection. And so I blew those up, and as the recital went, each student read part of the story before they played their piece. So they were telling the story along the way. The funny thing is, in that at one of those recitals, one of my adult students, Mary Lore, who happened to have a real flair for performing. Actually, I've never seen anyone have more fun at the piano than Mary Lore. Anyway, that's Mary Lore with two of my young students. And uh, she, I had asked her to play the final piece with me, which was the Waltz of the Flowers, a duet. And uh, afterwards, my two young students wanted their picture taken with her. <laughs> Not the teacher, no, Mary Lur. <laughs> now I'd like to highlight some of the collaborative music projects um, through, through the short video clips from student recitals. Um, we all know duets are fun and a great way to develop musicianship. And uh, when I look at this group of students, I must, I must say, and as I say, I think this is 1996, um, or that I, I still remember all of them. But I happen to know that what, you, what we have now from that group are three Harvard grads, a heart doctor, a Sentinel High School English teacher, a Boston University grad working with autism, and the list goes on. We're not just teaching musicians, we are helping very uh, important human beings develop and find their passion and develop their mind uh, and their heart. So it's uh, as it's it's fun to, fun to look back and and, uh, and but still know where some of them are now. But let's watch another group of about the same age uh, in a duet recital. And I happened in this group to have three pairs of siblings. You know how it is with siblings. You think, oh, perfect, we'll have them play duets. <laughs> and sometimes that works, and sometimes they don't get along. But these, these, these pairs did pretty well. And uh, there's usually, you know, uh, they're usually not equal in their ability or even fascination with the piano at the time. But we'll start with Abby and Graham, and I'd like you to notice the lovely wrist phrasing led by Abby in this little example. So here starts our home videos. <laughs>
cute, huh? <laughs> now for the Benson Brothers, who surprised me at a performance by singing the words to Dennis Alexander's little duet, Saxophone Romp, and mimicking the Blues Brothers with head shaking and a jazzy oh yeah at the end and a tremolo, which I had not taught them. <laughs> uh, again, excuse the shaky film, but um, I still treasure these old films. The Benson Brothers. <laughs> That was a surprise. <laughs> Okay, this is the last pair of siblings, Megan and Katie, and I decided to pick a little clip from them because their voicing and balance was so lovely. And um, sadly, I don't know the name, title of this composition, um, but I also later will read a little um, letter from Megan. So um, here's the last of the little duet. her added part, the glissando. <laughs> there are always a few surprises at recitals. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Well, of course, duet recitals require extra scheduling, advanced scheduling, and what I call partner lessons. And I used to like to do these in May, the last month of regular school term. And I would organize my students into, in this time, this year, uh, in the 13 different duet pairs who each had three partner lessons that much that month and I they were all scheduled um, and as you notice at the end on the 24th we also have dress rehearsals at the place before we performed so there is an extra effort but um, great reward from duet recitals so I still have wonderful memories of playing duets with my first teacher, and you probably all do too. Um, uh, when I was young, my teacher, my first teacher was Florence McClanahan, and this is a picture of her. Uh, I invited her uh, when she was in her late 70s, and she lived in, I grew up in Plains, and uh, about 78 miles from Missoula, and I invited her to come and join me and open the program of a duet program I called Just Miss Molly and Me. Well, that's because this duet program was everyone playing with me. So I was everyone's duet partner. And um, the recital even involved renting a second piano from Morgan Roth and having it brought to the church because my older students got to play two piano duets with me. Um, Florence uh, 
we played, we actually played a duet. And I, unfortunately, the clip that I have is, is the, the only big mistake we made in our cuts. So it's, it's, a, it's a really short uh, clip. But I do have a little bit. Uh, anyway, I started the program by introducing my first teacher. And we sat down and played this duet that we had played when I was young. It was wonderful to share this joy of duet playing with all of them. So not a musical ending to that clip, but you get the idea. Uh, Florence was as nervous as a cat. <laughs> But she did it, and as I say, she was probably 79. She had gone through multiple bouts with cancer, and uh, she was a survivor. But she had a deep love of music, and I was so lucky to have her as my teacher when I was young. So a uh, couple more clips from that Just Miss Molly and Me program. Um, I've probably paired my students together with each other six times or more in recitals. And, but this was really a gala event with them all playing with me and the two piano uh, arrangements, too. But we'll start with a Catherine Rollin tap extravaganza duet. And uh, here's Chris. <laughs> Extravaganza, Catherine Rollin. Um, this next one is a high school student, and it's a two piano work, Catherine Rollin's uh, Concerto in C for two pianos, the third movement. And I remember Adam at the time was not a practicer, and it does happen in high school. <laughs> but he maybe never had been, really. But anyway, um, if you if you listen to this, you can see that he was pretty darn motivated, and I know he was very proud of his fast scales. <laughs> Yep, it, 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 it got him going. Um, uh, the other thing, as you might notice, is that all of the students were the page turners. So they had to seriously follow the music, which, as you know, not all of, not all of them are the greatest readers. So that was good practice, too. And this is the last one from that recital. Um, I love seeing the smile on Emily's face and her conscious effort to keep her changing rhythms with the pulse established by my piano that I was on. And this is a little bit from the Spanish Rhapsody by Margaret Goldston for two pianos. Um, there were 16 more performers on that concert, uh, but this, this will be the last one you get to, <laughs> we listen to. I, I didn't necessarily pick out the fanciest. I just had sort of I thought there was some joy in some of the ones that were selected. Look 
looking for a cue. <laughs> As you can tell, my mother has gotten a uh, has has gotten a tripod now. <laughs> Not quite as bouncy. <laughs> Uh, well, today, no, I've, I've chosen to use, my, my focus has been on my students to tell the story of the rewards of my professional life, but it's also important to continue to play yourself, as I said. And as a professional accompanist uh, myself, I've performed everything from Brahms clarinet sonatas to Hindemith tuba sonatas, not on the tuba, <laughs> and Schumann, Dichter, Liebes song cycles, and played for the Montana State Chorale and toured and uh, accompanying the Montana Suzuki Institute for 25 years. So a variety of, of playing gigs I've had, and I love making music with others. So I decided I really must share that with my students. And so I decided um, since I've played for so many string players in town and have collaborated with particularly students of Madame, Madeline McKelvey's here and a string teacher here in Missoula, we decided to together select music for some pairs of violin and piano. And, um, and I uh, worked on teaching my students how to collaborate with other instruments. Uh, we called, I call this mu making music together recital. And as you know, there's much to be learned while accompanying another instrument. <laughs> uh, a couple short clips from this recital. Uh, there was a range of music from the Claude Bowling jazz suite for flute and piano to, uh, you'll get to hear a little bit of the saxophone version of Brahms' Hungarian dance number five. And, uh, and then some other uh, lovely violin and piano duos. This first one is... Um <laughs> That's actually the little Abby with the wrist playing the duets with her brother <laughs> a little later in life. Uh, of course, you know, we deal with, as I say, these are home videos and um, young students. None of, none of these were even in high school at the time. Well, to liven things up, we'll, we'll listen to uh, Cameron on the piano and Colin Oh, no, it's the other way around. Colin on the piano and Cameron's rendition of the Brahms Hungarian dance. job with the changing tempos and everything, you know, and as you can tell, were, were they having fun? <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. They were having fun. Um, now Cameron, the saxophone player, will switch to the piano with Abby on the violin, and this will be our last one, a, a Stiebelt Sonatina, Opus 33, number one. <laughs> Thank you. 
sorry, would it, that's, that one's a little bit long. Focus even for it, okay. Madeline and I ended the program by playing the first movement of Beethoven's Spring Sonata, Opus 24. It was wonderful to share our love of making music together and be an example in the front at the end. Although I remember both of us were pretty nervous. <laughs> A little bit of this. A favorite of mine. <laughs> um, so that that is completes that area. Um, an idea I came up with calling called summer immersion piano camps came to me about 25 years ago, and it's been fertile ground for new creative projects, and it's really been a delight over the years. Um, you can just see I've designed a variety of topics for these immersion weeks, and some of the immersion weeks were just individuals coming every day for 30 to 40 minutes daily for a week. Uh, actually, the first year that I did it, they came two weeks every day. Um, later, it's become just one week, although in another month, we might do another week. And then others are, I've organized for groups of three or four students with a particular um, a goal and a particular theme. Um, through these immersion sessions, I've seen students learn really good practice habits, develop better technique when you can see them every day and really hone in on something. Uh, and they've become recharged for the next year of study because they also find they can get quite, they can learn quite a bit. They can play a lot of music in five days. Um, so I'd like to read a note, a writ note written by a fifth grader after one of those initial summer sessions. That was Megan from the duet, the last duet um, group that you heard. <clears throat> uh, it says, I wanted to write to you. Can everyone see it pretty well? Yeah, so maybe I don't even have to read it. Um, it. It's just a testimonial to how that my goals for those, those camps had come through. <laughs> well, I just told them to write it to who, anyone, you know, so they didn't have to write it to me. It could be their grandparent or whatever. So she just decided it was no one in particular. But it was supposed, I'd asked them to write, um, you know, what their experience had been and what they felt they had learned. And so she could learn a whole song in a day if she practiced like she should. And at the PS on the bottom, I practiced each measure in the song four, three, two, one times each. And, um, and, and she quote, quoted me, I love the fact that she said, um, I liked her diligent efforts. <laughs> and then the big surprise at the end, you know, after she completed 16 and a half pages in 10 days, she also learned that her piano teacher makes wonderful cheesecake. <laughs> so you never know what they're gonna remember. <laughs> but it's all, it's all good. <laughs> Next are just a couple examples of the forms and application I sent to the parents um, to encourage and offer student participation in these camps. And so I would not only say place and time and cost, but the why is to learn to build chords, to learn primary chords in a key, to plan, pulse, and play, to play and sing any familiar song and to improve rhythm. Anyway, some particular focus of that camp that would be uh, 
why it would be a worthwhile thing for them to attend. Um, because of the level of scheduling and, and the level of teaching involved, um, the immersion accompanying camps that I've done, I've just been sort of on a, uh, offered it to only certain of my piano students I feel are ready at the reading level. And um, mostly middle school and early high school students were involved in this camp. And I uh, engaged and paid a small fee to a student French horn player, a violinist, and a flute and cello, cellist. So they got experience uh, accompanying a little bit of uh, different kinds of instruments, which involve listening at different levels. And uh, it was, it was uh, fun and very worthwhile. Let's Play the Masters Camp was planned for a group of really bright fourth grade boys. And during this week, they learned to play some easy arrangements of classic themes by the masters. They were just fourth graders. And, um, but they could, you know, they could read um, basically. And we focused on the four periods of music history and read about composers in a really fun book called Bach, Beethoven, and the Boys, um, which is a lighthearted version of music history by David Barbers. Anyway, at the conclusion of the camp, I asked the boys to turn in five favorite facts. And these were Charles's favorite facts. Well, as you can see, he got the juicy fact right off the bat. Haydn's head was stolen at his funeral. <laughs> oh, boy. Always lots of learning going on. <laughs> and um, in, included in these immersion, I have done multiple chamber music camps in the summer, uh, just for a week, and uh, focused on piano trios. Uh, I really wanted to share my love of chamber music with my students. And uh, thanks to my ongoing relationship with string teachers in town and accompanying a lot of the students, it was easy for me to be aware of, of string players that I could send an invitation to, to come and collaborate with my three selected, this, this, this week I had three trios working, three pianists. And I would give them, uh, sign the music a month in advance, give it to them in a month in advance, and the string players sometimes would get some help from their teachers and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but my students would always have at least a month of lessons on their parts because of course we all know piano trios, the piano is the main part. <laughs> So, um, but, it, and I, I have uh, three clips from what we did on the fifth day after just five days of rehearsing together and learning about what to listen for and, and all the elements of ensemble. Um, we performed at the Grizzly Peak Senior Residence um, on the fifth day. And fortunately, I, I do have a video of, of this. So a little bit from the Kinder Trio in G major, uh, Colin on the piano, Rachel on the violin. <laughs> These students were junior high and freshmen uh, at the time. Beethoven Trio, uh, number eight in one movement, posthumous, uh, is the next clip. And Moses on the piano, Abby uh, at the violin, and Annie again on the cello, who at the time was preferring to be called Carmen. She had red hair too. <laughs>
So, um, yeah, it's in five days, uh, four days really, the fifth day we went out to play. So, uh, to finish on a happy note, um, the Haydn Rondo from Trio and G, Hoboken 15, number 25. All of these trios, these piano trios, are published in uh, chamber music sampler books, edited by Joan. Her, uh, it's H A R O U. T-O-U-N-I-A-N. I'm just not sure how to, how to say that. So it's a Chose publication. So if you're interested later, you can, you can come ask me. Um, so this last one, um, a Haydn Rondo. <laughs> like my mother was learning how to do that close-up and she was liking the cello player. <laughs> well, these days, adult students fill my teaching days and they range from 70-year-old beginners to 60 and 70-year-old Gershwin and Beethoven Sonata and Greek Holberg suite players. They love their piano. Um, in fact, we have, I have two of my adult students here at conference. They signed up, paid the fees, and they're going to be at all the sessions. So that's how enthused they are, lifelong learners. Anyway, so I had to come up with some summer camp for them, too. And uh, I just have a couple pictures, luckily no. no. And this was a, an adult theory camp. So daily, they were outside at the table on the patio doing the worksheets and taking instruction, and then uh, moving into the studio to uh, do some of those examples at the, at the keyboards. So looks like they're having fun. Maybe I need to plan another summer camp for them. <laughs> it's also motivating to combine creative juices with other teachers. And uh, for a few years, Dorothy Peterson and Sharon McQuarrie and I co-taught music history type classes. You've heard about this years ago, but um, we did this about three times a year. And at the end, we would put on what we called a music carnival. And at Sharon's house, where the, the students would visit a variety of booths that we had sat up, set up, which where they would perform tasks, earn points, and at the end, buy prizes. Uh, a big production, uh, very successful and very enjoyable for the students. But from that, I came up with my own. Um, I came up with my own scale Olympics, and this really originated from me um, wanting to figure out how to spend May when the students weren't going to be practicing that much at the end of school, and. Uh, really hone in on their chords and their scales. And so it got me to work on that with them regularly and them to practice those things. And then we had this event to look forward to. Um, uh, again, each technique or task was tied to a game. So I had to have student assistants and grandmothers, even a neighbor helped run each different station, which were all set up in my basement. So uh, now we'll look at a few pictures from the Scale Olympics, and those were the different booths. Uh, this Chris, the one who played tap extravaganza, there's, there's Chris at college age. He was one of my helpers with his girlfriend, and they were happy helpers. <laughs> As I say, each station was identified. The dart throw involved playing major scales for me after they'd thrown the dart into, I think it was a hula hoop at the time. The rig, ring toss tested their major, minor, diminished, and augmented chords. And around their 
around there. You can't see very well, but there's a yellow card hanging from her neck. And that was where each station, there were nine stations, and that's where you would put the amount of points they had gotten from after they'd gone to each station and, and uh, done the task required. Here's tic-tac-toe chord, chord like a bingo game, major and minor chords. The little boy on the right, he'll be playing in the intermediate master class on Saturday. <laughs> As a 12-year-old, he's still not real big, but, but the years fly by and, and uh, so, many, so many good memories. Hopscotch interval, they would hopscotch to a beat, and when the beat stopped, their, the, note, the number they ended up on was the interval they were to draw on the staff. And the board game named Space Place also involved interval terms, but of course you know how they love board games. Of course, no Olympic music testing leaves out rhythm. <laughs> so I called this station Time Out. And the student would tap various two-measure rhythm examples for points. All in all, this Scale Olympics, as I said, helped me organize my teaching at the end of the school year. And it was an afternoon to, for the students to discover really how much they knew and, uh, and feel proud for the skills that they had, had acquired. Well, I'd like to end the session with a brief tribute to my teacher and dear friend, Dennis Alexander. As many of you know, he's given generously as a teacher, uh, as a composer, and as a pianist. And not only his own students, Ken and I being a couple of them in the room here, uh, <clears throat> but to teachers across the country through his workshops and compositions. So it was my pleasure to organize a special occasion for my students, and it was through the help of the Sanders County Arts Council, which is where I grew up, and my mother uh, was running that program at the time, so we got, we got some funds to help bring Dennis to Missoula, and I put on what I called the Dennis Alexander Piano Festival. Now, all my students played two pieces for him. Uh, one of them, at least, had to be one of his compositions. And he worked with, they all got many lessons, just like a festival, hap, uh, like adjudications occur. And four of the top students were selected and featured on a recital program the next day, which Dennis performed in Plains, uh, and we called that music the gift that keeps on giving. And in that concert, he played his own compositions and spoke a little bit about each piece. I played some of his duets with him, and then the four top students were featured to play. <clears throat> so that is, that's the program from that. Um, and those were the the featured students. In conclusion, I hope this studio teaching retrospective will spur you on uh, to stay enthused about your teaching and that you, our college student members, are really the future of our, this profession. And, um, but not just music, but music teaching is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs>